Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are happy to have uh, Professor Emma Frezinger here today uh, to give us a talk. Uh, she's going to talk about load planning of double stack intermodal trains and some related problems around that. So Professor Emma Frezinger, she's a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at University de Montréal. Uh, she's the holder of the Canada Research Chair in Demand Forecasting and Optimization of Transportation Systems and the holder of the CN Chair in Optimization of Railway Operations. Uh, she has a PhD in Mathematics from Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, Switzerland. Her areas of expertise include both demand forecasting and optimization of transportation networks. Her research is mostly focused on developing new methodologies, combining techniques from uh, operations research and machine learning to tackle large-scale real-world transportation problems. Uh, her current major pro projects are related to the optimization of railway operations. Her students and herself have won several international awards, including the prestigi prestigious PSL dissertation prize bestowed by the Inform Informs Transport Science and Logistics Society. She has realized numerous projects in collaboration with public and private actors. She is a member of CIRED. She works part-time as a scientific advisor for Ivado Labs, and she is a founding fellow of AI Sweden. Uh, without uh, uh, much ado, let's uh, give the mic to Professor Emma Freshinger and invite her to talk. Thank you very much, Riram, for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation um, to give this seminar. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. So I hope this is, uh, okay, let me see. Was it full screen earlier, maybe? Okay, is it, uh, can you see it clearly? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, otherwise don't hesitate to interrupt me uh, if you have uh, questions. Uh, so today um, I'm going to talk about my favorite application. Uh, uh, it's uh, railway transportation, as Sriram alluded to. Uh, this is work that we've been doing uh, with the, our industrial partner, so the Canadian National Railway Company, which is a, um, a large railroad in uh, North America. Um, and it's joint work uh, with uh, a student, Moritz Roof, um, who was really the, the PI on, on this work, and uh, Jean-Francois Cordeau, a colleague at the business school. Uh, so before I give you sort of the outline of the presentation, um, I will take some, uh, a few slides just to give you exactly which is the scope that we're going to focus on so that we're all on the same page. Um, so uh, the scope is um, uh, intermodal uh, terminal operations. So we're focusing with intermodal, I mean uh, container transportation. So consider that you have a lot of containers going between different origin destinations. Um, somehow, for instance, with trucks, uh, they get to intermodal terminals where they need to sort of change mode, typically from truck to train, but it could be uh, there, uh, it could also be ports, this intermodal terminal. And uh, then there is a long haul uh, leg uh, done by train, right? So uh, we're focusing really on the green dots here on the intermodal terminals. And there, there are a lot of decision-making problems occurring, right? It can pertain to the uh, terminal layout planning, you know, uh, how to um, assign uh, containers to storage locations. There are crane scheduling uh, problems, rail car management, and so forth. But we're going to focus here on how to load containers onto rail cars in these terminals. And some of the data or like sort of constraints and things I'm going to talk about today are really what we've been using is a, a real case study in North America, right? So there can be some sort of characteristics of the transportation that is really, you know, specific to North America. 
Okay, so what you need to keep in mind, I'm going to talk about sort of three different types of problems during this uh, presentation. So when I say LPP, it's going to mean no load planning problem. Okay, so let's assume for the moment that we ignore where containers are stored in the terminal. And the name of the game is to say, we have a set of containers that we know that we can load on sort of a, a sequence of rail cars. And now we want to find which slots. So below here, you can see an example of two rail cars. One rail car has one platform and another rail car has three platforms. You can see, I will assume that both, all of these platforms can be double stacked so that you can put one container on top of the other. Um, and I will always say when, I, when I'm talking about a set of rail cars, they're sharing a destination. So they have already been what we call blocked, right? So they are sort of grouping together rail cars that will go to a same destination, okay? And then we have a set of containers in the stored in the terminal and they can go to this destination on this given train service for instance typically there are more containers in the terminal that can be loaded than there is capacity on the rail car so we need to select the subset of those containers and we do that using some handling equipment and that can be a gantry crane or it can be a reach stacker vehicle i'm going to give example earlier so let's go back to this lpp problem so it means that I'm ignoring the exact sort of stacking of containers in the terminal. And I'm just going to say I'm selecting a subset of those containers and I'm going to assign them onto the rail cars. So which specific slot they're going to go into, whether bottom top, a bottom slot or top slot on this specific platform, for instance. Okay, and we want to do that such that we are minimizing the value of the containers that are left behind, or equivalently that we are maximizing sort of the usage of the rail cars and the value of the containers that we're putting on. And the value here could mean sort of if you have specific priorities on the containers, that you want to respect those priorities as much as possible. So that's for the LPP. Now, if we look at the load sequencing problem, it means that let's say we have already solved the LPP. So we know which container should go in which slot. Now, the load sequencing problem uh, will determine how this handling equipment should load the containers onto the rail car. So which is the sequence in which we're going to load the containers? Okay, so this is the sequencing problem. There are different variants of that, but now I'm just sort of defining what is going to be our setting here. And then we have the core focus on this talk. It's the load planning and load sequencing problem, which I will denote by LPSP. And this is to solve these two problems jointly. So we're not first solving the LPP, fixing the load plan, and then doing the sequencing as best as possible. I'm going to convince you why these problems should be solved actually jointly. So both of them together. Okay, so now we're ready for the outline. Uh, you can see on the top right the reference to uh, the paper that sort of describes this work. It's not going to be a very technical presentation because I will not have time in 45 minutes to introduce all of the notations. So I'm trying to, I'm going to try to convey sort of the problem description um, and what makes this problem challenging. And I'm going to convey how we build the formulations, but without really giving all of the math behind. So if it kind of gets, it picks your curiosity, I invite you to go and read the paper. Um, so I'll give a few words on the, uh, the sort of the different variants of the formulation. I constructed it a bit like a puzzle, but you don't have a single solution to this puzzle. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about the results and uh, to give you a sort of a spoiler, uh, what we see is that if we're solving this LPSP, so the joint problem, uh, we can reduce the number of lifts that we're doing of containers, so the number of moves by 11 to 16 percent on average, while keeping an optimality in terms of the load plan, so really using uh, the best possible of the capacity on the rail cars. And this is compared to sort of solving first the loading and then the sequencing. So the name of the game is I'm going to tell you a bit of the story um, behind this and how we're solving the problem. But this is sort of the key result. 
And then um, I hope to have a lot of time to the end, or at least a significant amount of time, because I want to touch upon a few works that we did related to this. Uh, so up to the third part, it's all about exact solution approaches. We care about optimality, uh, but we've done a few works on heuristics for this problem too. And I just quickly want to touch upon how we built those heuristics and which is their performance. And then a few related works, um, because this, this problem for me is really in a building block problem to better optimize intermodal rail transportation. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about why I believe so and how that can be tackled. Okay, so let's first dig into uh, the problem description. So what are the challenging details here? So I'm saying here, same, say, but different, because when we're looking at rail cars and we're looking at containers, uh, I mean, despite their colors, they look sort of very similar, right? They are, these are just boxes and, and the rail cars are just rail cars. Now, actually, this is not true. And this is what makes the problems quite challenging. Let's start by looking at the rail cars. Okay, so on the top here, you see an example of a, a rail car on the North American market. So you can see that there is like a well here. The first container that loads will sort of sink down into this space. This is so that the center of mass is kept as low as possible. And that is sort of the bottom slot. And then you can put something on top. So at here, I stylized sort of an example of a rail car with five platforms. So they are denoted A, the last one B, and then you have C, D, E at the middle. You can also have a rail car with just one platform, in which case it would be called A. You can have three platforms, and then it would be A, B, and C in the middle, and so forth, right? So this is sort of the logic. Um, and uh, obviously what they're, in, I mean, in, in addition to having these specific sizes of the, of the platform, so they can be of 40 foot or 50 foot uh, long, um, they have different weight holding capacities and different loading capabilities. And, and so with loading capabilities, I mean, which sizes of containers that you can put where. OK, some can take extra heavy weight, some cannot, uh, and so forth. What is important to keep in mind, which is more maybe a bit less relevant to the load planning, but very relevant to a network planning perspective, is the reason why one want to use sort of five platform rail cars as opposed to one platform rail cars is because the spacing between the platforms are less than when you separate them into different uh, rail cars. So you can sort of put more platforms into a same train capacity if you use more platforms. So this is sort of a better usage of the train capacity. Okay, now in terms of the containers, it's the same here, right? Same, same, but different. So on the international um, uh, market, we have 20 foot containers and 40 foot containers, um, high cube and low cube. So they vary in their uh, height and 45 foot. So the way you can stack these depend on the steel frame that is sort of the bearing of the container. So if you put two containers at the bottom, you can put a 40 foot on top. And then the steel frame of the 45, the 48, and 53 foot containers will always be at the 40 foot mark, right? So you can stack these on top of each other. Um, the 53 foot containers are really specific uh, to the North American uh, market as well as the 48. So we have the larger ones. Maybe there are in India too, I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, you have specific sort of uh, containers that will have very specific, so what I will refer to technical loading restrictions, uh, like if you have an open top, an open side, um, there can be reefers that need to be connected to a power source when they're on the train such that they are sort of uh, keeping um, uh, keeping the reefers cold um, and so forth. And so these ones, one would need to sort of consider specific loading rules for. So now coming to sort of the constraints when we're loading this. So obviously uh, you store that, yes? A, a quick question, Emma. So when you are uh, talking about the previous problem of selecting the subset, technically it's more like a knapsack problem or a slight generalized version of knapsack. Is that the right way of thinking about it? 
Yes. And so it would be like, an, well, it's maybe more related to a bin packing. Okay. Uh, so you can view, because you have the packing constraints on the rail cars. Okay. Uh, but yes, if we don't have the loading constrictions, then it's just like a knapsack. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So now you saw that there is this well. So when we're loading containers on Corel cars, obviously we need to consider the size, right? You cannot put something in the bottom slug that doesn't fit, fit uh, physically. Um, and then on the top slot, uh, we can put, so if we have a 40 foot well, we can put a 40 foot in the bottom. And in theory, we can put a 53 foot container on the top. But what will happen is that it will sort of pass the 40 foot on each side. So now we need to make sure that we have sufficient space on the rail car to place uh, this 53 foot, which means that typically if we have a 40 foot wells, we can't put 53 foot in every top slot. So we have very specific sort of loading restrictions that pertains to size only. And we will call these feasible uh, ways of loading sizes onto containers. There are loading patterns, which will define that. And actually, when we're looking and specifically for three, uh, for five uh, 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 platform rail cars, there is really a lot of those uh, loading patterns, right? So if you consider that you have a mix of rail car, uh, of containers, which are like 40, 45, um, and 53, and then you need to consider all the possible ways that you can load those sizes on a five platform rail cars, which have, you know, 10 uh, slots this uh, becomes a lot of loading patterns. And then we have restrictions with respect to the center of mass. So you can't put too heavy on the top because then uh, it can uh, fall uh, the containers. So we have a restriction that the center of a mass needs not to be higher than a certain value above the rail. And this is actually something that is nonlinear, um, but you'll see later, uh, I'll just quickly mention. So this is something that we can linearize so that we work with linear formulations later. Um, we have that we cannot exceed weight holding capacity. And then we have these technical constraints that I was mentioning earlier, right? So there can be, if we have dangerous material in certain, they cannot be too close to the locomotives. Um, reefers need to be put together and so forth. And these can actually complicate things. I'm not going to touch too much about that today because it doesn't really impact the sequencing. Sometimes even these technical loading constraints makes it easier for the, for the sequencing part because oftentimes those containers are stored in a separate area in the, in the terminal. So the sequencing problem can become even easier uh, on that. Okay. And I'm getting on, continue with the problem description. There is a lot of background material to this problem. So uh, now what about the handling equipment, right? That is supposed to transport the containers from their storage area onto the rail cars. We're considering two different equipments. So either a gantry crane, which is actually not used really in the terminals that we have data from, but we're still sort of, uh, these are easier to deal with. So we are formulations that can deal also with gantry cranes. So they go on the top and they can pick any container that is on the top. Then you have reach stacker vehicles. They will come from the side and pick containers. Um, so obviously they can only pick containers that are on the top, but their movements are more restricted than the gantry crane that can sort of go above all of the stacks and go. They're freer to move between different sort of rows and stacks than the gantry crane. That's maybe, you know, there is easier to have interference with other cranes. So these are more mobile, but they cannot reach any depth, right? And so here you can see an example for the for the reach stacker, what you're not allowed to do, right? So let's say you have a stack here. Obviously, I cannot put the one that is directly take this one because it's below the green one. If I come here in the figure D, can you see my mouse when I'm uh, pointing? Okay, good. Yes. So uh, when I'm going from here towards the green, 
uh, I can only, I cannot pick any of these uh, orange ones because since this arm is moving deeper, um, I can only pick up this orange one if its weight is not uh, greater than a certain threshold, right? So above a certain threshold, this one is forbidden. This one I can never take um, because it's hidden behind the green one. This one also has a weight restriction, but now you see a depth of two. So now it has to be even lighter to be able to pick it up. And this one is too deep, right? I cannot go above three containers and take this one, okay? So all of our data, like I mentioned, uh, are way in terminals for which, uh, uh, in which they use a reach stacker, uh, but we could, that doesn't prevent us sort of from also trying entry crane. So C, C, D, and uh, sorry, uh, in the previous slide, C, D, and D, you cannot pick the orange one due to kind of safety issues that it might fall on the green block or something like that. Why is that? No, it's really, it's really, this one is because the arm of the reach stacker here is not long enough and the visibility from the driver is not good enough to be able to pick this one. So this one is not an allowed move. Um, you said C and D, right? Uh, D and no. D. Yeah, okay, and these ones you can pick, okay? You can physically pick this one and this one, but only if their weight is not too heavy, because like with our arm, the further we go from other body, the heavier it is, right? Okay. And so it the the the, capa the this depends on the capacity of the reach stacker. So we just use a threshold, and then we take sort of the series number of the reach stack, and we say which are sort of the requirements of of, of each one. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, so now let's look at a very small example to explain you what is the win-win situation that we want to get here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's remember that what is typically done in practice and even in a lot of the literature is to first solve the load planning problem. Once you have an assignment of containers to slot, you solve a sequencing problem conditional on this one, right? So this is sort of above the dotted line. This is what is illustrated. So here we have no stacking information. We're solving the LPP. So here there is no subset to be selected. I have the capacity for two containers. I just need to decide where to put them. So let's assume that you know, the load uh, planning problem is now uh, you know, ignorant of what is their uh, stacking information. Let's assume that I can put either the pink at the bottom or the pink at the top. Now the load plan decides to put the pink at the bottom. OK, it is super happy because we have 100 percent slot utilization. We leave no containers behind and everything is good. Right. Then conditional on this solution, we're going to solve the LSP. Now, the LSP has the information about the stacking of the containers. So let's assume here that the pink was below the other container. Now, there is no way to respect this load plan without doing three lifts, because first I need to remove the top container, get the pink one, put it in the bottom, and then put the other on top, right? But we can easily see that if there are two feasible solutions on the load plan here, two feasible optimal solutions, actually, it's to put the pink either at the bottom or at the top. I see that here I can do the sequencing with only two lifts and get still the optimal solution on the load planning side. So this is the win-win situation that we wanna, we wanna get. And what I'm going, what is the intuition behind here is that there are actually a very large number of optimal solutions to the LPP. It's played with a lot of symmetry and there are a lot of optimal solutions. So what we want to do here is sort of leverage the flexibility that we have on the LPP side to gain sort of performance in terms of the sequencing side. Okay. And so this is to wrap up the problem description, an illustration of a very small LPSP instance with the solution. So what we want to have is sort of, we have containers that are stacked. We have some rail cars that are free. We're going to assume a static and deterministic setting in the sense that I know exactly when we start the loading, which is the set of containers that we can load. And we know which are the rail cars uh, that are available and they are free. Okay, so there is like no uncertainty, no dynamic information here. 
Then we're going to assign those rail cars, a subset onto a slots of the rail cars, and we have a sequence in here. So when we say a detour, we assume that we have a front and a rear side of the stacks. So here we see at the first stage, I'm going to take, going to do a detour, I'm going to take C9, and I'm going to put it on B2. And then I'm going to take C3, which is on the top, and I'm going to put it on T2. Okay, then here the, I need to do a rehandle and so forth. So this is sort of an illustration of the solution. I hope now that the problem is super clear and otherwise please uh, go ahead and ask questions. So in terms of the literature, uh, obviously- have, uh, we, yes? sorry, There is one question in the chat. Uh, the, it's, I, let me read it for you. I had a question. Suppose you already select the list of containers to load is it possible to get at least one optimal solution for loading in most cases? Uh, can you repeat if I assume that? Suppose you already select the list of containers to load. Is it possible mm -hmm. to get at least one optimal solution for loading in most cases? Yes, in most cases, um, if the set that you have selected is large enough, right? So you can get into some strange sort of situations if um, you, uh, you have either very few containers, right? Or if you have a very bad matching between the type of rail cars and the type of containers. Let's say I have almost only 53 foot containers to load, but uh, what I got to the terminal was almost exclusively 40 foot rail cars. Then you can be in trouble. So you can have this kind of like specific cases, but most of the time, yes. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. So there is a lot of literature uh, on problems that are either exactly what I was explaining to you or versions thereof. If you look at the literature on maritime transportation, there are a lot of those which are called like block relocation, pre-marshalling, storage allocation, and so forth. Um, there is um, literature on sort of the more European setting where you cannot do double stacking of rail cars because of the electric wiring uh, above rail. Um, and so there, you, there is quite a lot of literature on single stack um, problems and sequencing for that. Um, there is very little work on double stack rail cars. So we have a paper on the load planning problem and this load sequencing. And the gap is really to doing this integration uh, to the best of our knowledge. Nobody has worked on it before. What one keep, needs to keep in mind, that's why I showed sort of the win-win. Um, this is very specific to the double stacking, right? That you can do this gain in the yard to achieve. If I have a single stack, it's easier in some sense. Um, and so this is really why we're considering this to be an important specific case to, to work on. Okay, so now let's look at the formulations with an S that we are uh, um, considering. So I see this as a puzzle a bit. And so you'll see we're going to build different versions depending on how we put these pieces together. So let's start in the middle on the left hand side here. Um, the one piece is the LPP, right? So this is the formulation from Mantovani et al, a paper we worked on a while ago. It will decide exactly how we can assign containers onto rail cars. Here, this is kept as is, right? Because this is already formulated. Um, like I said earlier, the center of mass, uh, we can uh, sort of linearize. So all of these formulations that I'm going to show you are integer linear programming formulations, actually with only binary variables. Um, and so we're keeping this piece is part of all of the formulations. Now, uh, moreover, I'm not going to talk specifically for reach stackers and gantry cranes. The results will be separated for them. So you will see results for uh, these two. The difficulty there is it's more difficult to solve for reach stackers because there are more constraints. So it's easy to take a formulation for reach stacker and relax certain uh, constraints, and then it will be as solving for gantry cranes. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, 
then uh, we have actually more than two in the paper, but we were asked by the reviewers to put more to the appendix. We thought it was interesting to sort of analyze how different formulations perform. Um, I, I kept two here, which are called A and B. So A for at and B for by. So these are, uh, I'm going to show you later the decision variables, but essentially A is like we load their decision variables for loading a container at a specific stage. And B has two index variables for uh, containers loading by a specific stage. So this sort of um, depends on how we're writing the, the constraints, um, but the number of variables remains the same. And then we have three different objective functions, which will really determine the difficulty of the instances. So typically two-way distance, so looking at the distance that a crane does while carrying a load and then going back to the stacks is typically not considered in load sequencing problems because it's very hard to, it comes with the, at the cost of, additional variables and many more constraints, but we still wanted to put it in here to see how hard it is. Then we have one way distance, which is the distance that the crane carries a load, which is when it really is wear and tear that sort of occurs on the equipment. And then we're considering a case sort of if you have a dense terminal and distance is not a major aspect that you wanna optimize. Um, uh, we're considering sort of removing distance altogether and just penalizing lifts and detours. So this is sort of, let's go more into sort of the details. So keep in mind, all the constraints here are linear. So there are two key decision variables in the LPP formulation. These are all two uh, index variables. So one is from the container to slot. So a slot is on a specific uh, bottom or top on a specific platform on a specific rail car. And then we have variables for um, a rail car to loading pattern, right? So we need to decide which sizes that can be put on each um, in each slot and that's governed by the loading pattern. Now, a complicating factor here, as I mentioned earlier, is that this uh, the cardinality of this set is very large. So this is one of the complicating factors. Then we have uh, sets of linear constraints of different types. So obviously the assignment constraints, the weight, so we're respecting the weight restrictions, the center of mass and the technical that I was referring to earlier. And here you have the reference to the paper if you're interested. Uh, we also have two auxiliary variable, two sets of auxiliary variables, which uh, helps us write the constraints, which is the container to platform and the container to rail car. Okay. There is now a, let's see uh, yes. a question from one of the uh, attendees. Are containers in the US standardized in terms of length, breadth, and height across all 50 states? And do they carry more or less the same amount of weight? Okay, so uh, they are standardized um, and even standardized across uh, Canada. So the railroads are going both US, Canada, and I think to maybe, uh, I'm not sure the, what is further south. Anyways, at least the US and Canada. Uh, now, they do not carry more or less the same weight. So the containers, uh, can have quite different weights. Um, there is repositioning of empty containers sometimes, and uh, there is, um, uh, I mean, the the weight can vary quite uh, widely. Like right now, in the they are carrying sometimes grain in the uh, in the containers, which makes them very heavy, and sometimes it's very light. So this is, but the, st the sizes are standardized, and that's why we can actually pre-generate this sort of loading pattern. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, sorry for a bit of a background noise. It's my kids are going to school. <laughs> Okay, it's morning here. Uh, now let's look at the uh, the sequencing formulation. Then I promised you two different. So both of these formulations have two index variables. The other formulations, which are in the appendix of the paper, have three index variables. So the three index variables would be container to slot 
at time, right? So you have a very large number of variables, but you have rather few constraints. The formulations that we keep here, which are actually have a, a, a better performance than the three index ones, are these two where we have both the same sets of variables, it's just their definition, they vary, so hence the constraints are varying, uh, which is IT, so the container I is loaded at stage T or by stage T, and then QT, which uh, we don't really need, but our auxiliary ones, that is uh, uh, indicating whether the bottom slot is fully loaded at stage T or by stage T. Okay, so these are sort of the two, uh, or like there's only one set of key variables. And here, um, there are uh, different sets of constraints. Um, so we have to have uh, constraints that are sort of, you know, consistent with this definition of the variables, what you can do by or at each stage. Um, we need to make sure that the sequencing variables are feasible with respect to sort of the load assignment that the other variables are giving. Um, we need to make sure that the sequencing are respecting the accessibility of the containers. And here it's where we're paying uh, the price for the reach stacker uh, vehicles because these sets of constraints are larger. There are more when we're dealing with reach stackers. And then we have restrictions with respect to the double stacking that we're sort of keeping track on with these auxiliary variables. And all of these constraints, we can write them easily as linear constraints. And then in terms of the formulation, so I will try to speed up things. Um, here, uh, all of the okay, formulations are considering detours and rehandling. So if you need to do a detour to go to the back of the stack, um, or if you need to double touch containers, right? We're not optimizing where we should place those that we're double touching. We're sort of assuming that either they can be, they can be placed so they're not in the way or they will be placed close to where they're eventually going to be loaded. And then we had, as I mentioned earlier, two-way distance, one-way distance or no distance. In terms of solution procedure, if you just give this ILP formulation to a general purpose solver, it will not solve uh, because it's, uh, it's plagued with symmetry and these are relatively large formulations. So we're doing a very simple two-stage, uh, two-phase procedure um, where we're generating um, a relatively good feasible solution by solving first the LPP and then using an heuristic for the sequencing. Uh, and that can give us a relatively good uh, initial solution to the LPSP, which makes it possible to solve this problem in reasonable time. <laughs> So let's look at the let's look at the results. So we have the same layout for all, which comes uh, from sort of the terminal layouts that is typically used by CN. Uh, so you have lots of containers, you have a front side, a back side, and you have rail cars on the on the tracks. Um, we have different size of instances. So going from X small with just 15 containers to X large with 150 ones. If we look at the literature, so the state of the art on single stack rail cars solve up to 40 containers with an exact approach. So we call these small, but they are particularly interesting to us because they are slightly larger than what can be solved in the simpler single stack case. So you can consider this is already sort of the state of the art on the, on the um, double stack uh, case. And then we're going to sort of look at different mixes of containers. So we have 50 instances in total, 25 or 40 foot only, and these are actually harder. And here you have mixes of containers, 25. So in total for each size, we have 50, and we're going to consider different formulations and handling equipment. Okay, so let's start with the two-way distance, which is, you know, uh, the hardest one, we assume that we have a time budget of 30 minutes, which is okay. Uh, nevertheless, we let the time limit be 10 hours just to see uh, if we can find an, an optimal solution. And uh, we are using CPLEX. So 
in short, the two-way distance is too hard to be solved. So let's start to look at the format, which will be the same for all of the tables, right? So we have A formulation, B formulation for gantry cranes and for reach stackers. Um, we report how many instances that were solved to optimality, zero here for gantry cranes, seven for each stacker, and five here. So we cannot solve to optimality even within 10 hours. If we look at the computing time, it's going to be for only those that were solved to optimality, and it's in seconds. So we can see the seven were solved on average on 553, 553 seconds. And we look at optimality cap for all those that were not solved to optimality. So at timeout, and here you can see that we have very large gaps. So essentially the two-way distance is too challenging to solve, okay? Uh, it seems to be a bit easier for the reach stacker, but nevertheless, this is really too challenging to solve. So it's more interesting to look at a one-way distance and you can really see why the two-way distance is so hard if we look at the number of constraints, right? So in terms of number of variables, it's not that much more, but the number of constraints increases by an order of magnitude, right? So this is really why the two-way distance is a lot harder to solve. So let's move to the one-way distance. So now you see on the top, you have the X small instances and on the bottom, you have the small instances. So recall, this is the state of the art. And here we can see that now suddenly we remove the two-way distance and now we solve all instances to optimality in short computing time, right? So now the X small instances become super easy to solve. The small ones, um, we can also solve, find high quality solutions to all of the instances within the time budget. So we see that most of them, we are solving to optimality with an average computing time within the time budget. Um, but we can see that for those that we do not solve to optimality, the gap is still uh, below 1%. And actually, there are uh, almost no, uh, in, it should not be in productive, it should be in productive movements of any of the, uh, of the, um, of the equipment for with very few exceptions. So I think this is a bit related to the question you asked Sriram. So actually here, there's so much flexibility that we can do on the load plan that when we're solving these jointly in most of the instances that we solve to optimality, there are like no in productive movements on the sequencing side. You can always, almost always in most cases, find sort of solutions where you don't need to double handle containers. And I think this is really the key message here, which is super interesting from a pr terminal productivity perspective. If we ignore distance, now we can try to see, can we solve even harder instances, right? And so what we're seeing is that for now we, we are setting the X small instances aside and we're looking only at the small, medium and large, right? And so we'd see solving exactly the small ones uh, it becomes relatively easy now, it's within the time budget. The medium ones we can still do, but not really within the time budget, but we can solve to optimality, but for gantry cranes only. So the first, the top here is for gantry cranes, the lower is for reach stacker. And sort of reach stacker is still too hard, large and X large are, are too hard. And if you look at the gaps that you get at timeout after 10 hours, these are huge, right? So um, this, it's still a challenging problem. So this is sort of a good initiative to start working on these type of problems. I think there are tons of things that one could do to sort of try to reduce symmetry in this problem and so forth. But here we can see that warm start is clearly uh, insufficient. And finally, what is interesting, I'm looking at time. I think I'm okay still. Um, uh, so if we are now comparing, uh, solving with the classical way, first the load planning, then the load sequencing, and compare that to uh, only uh, to solving the joint problem, so the LTSP, what we're looking at now is the small instances, so the state of the art, and we're using the one-way distance, and we're taking all of the instances that we solved to optimality. 
Okay, and now we're comparing, we're taking those. So with the optimality, we have no additional handling of containers at all. And then if we're looking at the sequential approach, you can see that with the gantry crane, which is in blue, you have sort of a distribution where on the X axis, you have the number of rehandled containers, right? So you can really see that you have a mean which is uh, greater than zero and you know, you have a significant amount of rehandlings. As expected, this distribution shifts to the right for the reed stacker because you have less flexibility, right? And so if we're looking at the average savings here, um, we are in the order of 11% for gantry cranes and 16% for reed stackers. So this is really the gain of the LPSP. Okay. Um, now, let me wrap up. Do I, can I take five more minutes? Yes? Okay. Yes. So I think this problem has potentially a very high value, uh, right? We know here, I've only considered a sequencing problem. Those who are very familiar with this literature will say, why aren't you not minimizing make span instead? What about the scheduling? And so there is a time dimension here, which we're assuming sort of distance and detours are a good proxy for that. But, you know, being able to, each time we're double lifting, there's also time involved, right? So there is really a significant cost related to sort of lifting containers that need to be placed somewhere and so forth. So being able to save on this uh, is important for terminal productivity. And we see that we can solve, you know, these are 50 containers, may seem very small, but we're solving it, you know, for, uh, a specific destination, right? So these are not tiny, tiny instances. Nevertheless, it would be good to be able to push it to even larger instances. Uh, important to note is that one formulation does not, uh, uh, and we found that interesting, the rear found it less interesting, but we, we, the one formulation does not dominate the other, but uh, they are good at different instances, which means that one could potentially reduce the variance in computing time by having multiple sort of formulations running simultaneously, right, to solve these, to see which one finishes first, which could be, you know, a, a way to hedge against the uncertainty in computing time. And it's difficult to solve, so there is work to be done here still. There is also other work that we did to try to speed up and solve larger, we have not yet published uh, this work. They are part of, well, it's published as part of master's thesis for now. So on the top, what we did was to uh, have an heuristic solve the LPSP, but in the classic way of first solving the LPP and then the LSP. So what we did is we, we take an optimal solution of the LPP and then uh, we define equivalence classes of the containers. So essentially it is just, which are the sets of containers that we can swap um, in the optimal solution while keeping the optimality of the solution, right? So you can view it as a tweak, right? We're not sort of generating all of the optimal solutions. There are probably a lot more than the ones that we're finding, but we're just doing these equivalent classes. And then we're giving that to a dynamic programming heuristic that can then do the sequencing, leveraging that flexibility that we gave it with the, uh, with the um, LPP solution. So we're sort of guaranteed not to do worse on the LPP. And then we try to do as good as possible on the LSP. And this works super well, actually. It's not a super fancy trick, but it works really well. And we can solve instances up to 120 containers in less than five minutes, and we get very high quality solutions. And then uh, we made another attempt not to use the integer uh, programming uh, formulation at all for the LPP and solve everything with the heuristic. So the LPSP jointly with the heuristic. Uh, what works best was an iterative deepening A star algorithm. And it works really well as well. We can solve also less than five minutes large instances for the one-way distance cost. Uh, I didn't say it up here. It's also the one-way distance cost up here. Um, and we even did an attempt on a reinforcement learning algorithm. And the, the, well, why we are working on these ones here is actually because we want to move towards dynamic and uncertain environments. And then we need something that is really fast 
We were hoping that an RL algorithm could give us something that is really fast to solve so we can integrate it into a dynamic stochastic setting. But actually it's quite hard from a reinforcement learning perspective, this environment. So we didn't get as good solutions as with the, with the A star algorithm, which is nothing fancy here on this side. So, uh, yes. Uh, there is a question uh, here on the chat. So let me read it out. When solving the load plan, we assume that there is a cost associated with not picking it up. The uh, that is the containers in have a priority value. Is there a system to assign priority values to containers or is there a research gap specially for double stack trains? No, it's really a way to assign priorities to containers. And I should have mentioned that I did not. In our results, we are not assuming that there are any priorities. And actually, this is a harder, because you have a lot more symmetry in the problem. So we're considering the harder case when there are no priorities. But we are part of this as the formulation, because sometimes terminals do have priorities with specific containers that really need to go. So it's a way to integrate priorities in a general fashion, but we did not hear to sort of tackle the hardest case in the uh, in the computing results. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, uh, actually, two more questions coming up. So one, does it help if we solve the problem with soft constraints with some penalty rather than hard constraints in the model formulation? And then why are constraints associated with the containers in top stack linear since the stacking depends on the containers in the lower stack? Yeah, uh, so these are good questions. So the first, uh, uh, let me start with the last one and then you record the first, let me see, can I see the, um, okay, so the soft constraints, um, these are actually not soft constraints. Uh, sometimes we say, oh, might be easier with a soft constraint. We should only have as hard constraints that are really hard. And here, the loading constraints actually are really hard because these are security constraints. And so typically, most of the constraints that we have here, we can, I mean, I, mean, I can't soften either the sequencing constraints. I cannot suddenly sort of, at a high cost, take one below. It, it, it doesn't. So I don't think that there is a way to model these ones with soft constraints, but maybe I'm wrong and maybe it's possible to do it, get good solutions and then post process them. I'm not sure, but we haven't looked at, uh, at this. Um, and uh, then let me see what was the second top, why they are linear. Yeah, so this is a good point. Uh, there is actually a few tricks that you need to do to get the linear constraints, um, but it's actually better to push um, pre-processing, which we can do very fast to make sure that we can linearize all of these constraints. Um, rather than trying to treat them as nonlinear. So some of them are nonlinear, but we can linearize them quite easily in the pre-processing phase with just parameters. So this is sort of, there is a, a bit of a tweak that you need to do also because I haven't talked about the 20 foot containers, but you need to have sort of two 20 foot containers in the bottom slot to be able to top load. So this is another sort of complication that you need to deal with in order to make the formulations work. So I didn't give all of the details here, but the linearizations, you, um, you can read more about them in the Montevano et al. paper. Uh, one more question, sorry. Uh, are railway mm -hmm. containers uh, used in North America different from the ones used in shipping in terms of material, durability, longevity, reusability, et cetera? For example, the containers used while constructing Stadium 974 in Qatar during the World Cups were used once and they were shipping once, I think. Uh, no, these ones are reusable. So these are really, you know, the uh, the, the worldwide shipping ones. So these are reused uh, and used and reused again. I'm not sure I'm answering, but yes, they are, they are used for it. Uh, I'm not sure what is actually the statistics on the duration that they are used, but I think it's, relatively long i wouldn't dare guess exactly but they are reused for a long time okay thank you yes sorry go ahead ah okay 
So anyways, so, so what we want to do um, in the future is to uh, relax certain of the assumptions that we did here. So in addition to speeding up, but I gave you a few ideas on the heuristics that we want to use for that. And then it's moving into environments. Consider that a terminal still receives containers while the loading is happening, right? So then you can either assume that you have knowledge of the containers that are going to come and when they're going to come, in which case we would have a dynamic environment, which is still harder to deal with than the static setting that we have now. And what is actually even closer to reality sometimes is that there is also uncertainty in here. So we know that there may be more containers coming. Um, so we can have some knowledge about or belief about the distributions, but we don't know when they will arrive and if they will arrive uh, before the cutoff time for the loading and they are arriving as the loading is taking place. And then we will get the dynamic and stochastic setting, which we have not dealt with either, but I think is super interesting problem. And then we have sort of simplified because we are in the case where we are assuming that a crane has already been assigned to the loading, but there can be cases where there are multiple cranes that are doing loading, in which case one would need to sort of deal with the cane scheduling problem as well. And this one we have set aside for the moment, but it could be interesting to look at for certain terminals. So if I have, I asked you for five more minutes earlier, but I took a few questions. Can I take five? Uh, okay, okay. I just wanted to say, because, so think about this, right? We know that the terminals, the intermodal terminals, are their performance will have an impact on the overall network performance, right? So if we're not loading well at specific terminals, the sort of whole network operation is going to be affected negatively. But before we're solving these operational problem in the terminals, there are other tactical problems that are solved, which in turn are actually impacting how good the terminals can do, right? Once the rail cars are in the terminal, so this was another question you asked, Freeram, right? Can I always find a good solution? And I said, well, if you end up with bad rail cars for the container mix that you have, you're sort of in trouble, right? But you, they, the terminals get that rail car mix because there was a network decision to send those K rail cars to that specific terminal. So something that I'm super interested in working on is sort of these more tactical problems that come before that will dictate essentially the upper bound on how good the terminals can do. This is what they get, right? If you get into trouble on the sort of, you've got a bad assignment from the network perspective, you can only do so good. But if that network planning problem has been done well, then you can suddenly not only increase the network performance, but also the terminal performance, and you get again this kind of win-win. So I really think that there is a huge potential in looking at the interdependency between these problems. And I think that these load planning problem is a central piece and building block in looking at those for two types of problems, but maybe others. One is booking control. So consider that you're having a railroad that is governed by bookings, reservations on the trains. So shippers will call and say, I have, you know, X number of containers that should go from A to B. Um, on this particular time. And so you're sort of booking capacity on the train for those. Now you need to decide whether you accept reject or at what date you're going to push those uh, container reservations such that you're maximizing profit and making sure that you have smooth sort of operations. So that's one problem. Um, the other one is what I was alluding to, sort of the network planning one. So doing book planning, deciding how much capacity we should allocate to each destination and how we're going to sort of manage the rail cars in the network, because here we have different types of rail cars that we need to manage. And we want to make sure that we get sort of the right mix of rail cars to the right terminal at the right time. And so we have been uh, looking at these uh, problems uh, and to say, OK, but then it means that we don't have all of the perfect uh, information when we're solving these. We don't know exactly the weight of the containers. Uh, we often can assume that we know their size, but definitely not all of their 
characteristics. So even if we would like to solve a load planning problem, we cannot really solve it or we would need to solve it under uncertainty. So what we worked on was to say, if you look at the top level of this figure, <clears throat> you're seeing sort of a representation of the load planning problem. So you know detailed descriptions of the containers and how they're load. Now we just say, let's assume we don't need to know that level of detail for the tactical planning purposes. I only need to know either some high level description of the solution. This high level description can be, you know, just how many containers. Now you see, I don't have all these fancy colors. I just have red ones and, and, and black ones, which determine the size essentially. I don't know any other characteristics. And I just want to know how many I can load on each rail car say of each, or even more aggregate, I can look at just saying, I just want to know how many rail car I need and how many of each type of container I can load. That's all. That's sufficient for the other decisions that I need to make. Or even further, I could say, oh, I only need to know the value of the solution, which would be the objective function value of this one. This would be sort of the coarsest sort of view on, on this solution. And what we show in this paper that I cite here is that we can use machine learning to predict these descriptions. And we can get those descriptions to be close to an, a lower bound um, on the error that we compute with a sample average approximation. So essentially these tasks, this task of sort of getting a high level view on the problem solution subject to uncertainty because I don't have perfect information here, we can solve pretty well with machine learning. And I find this very exciting because that means that we can sort of leverage these machine learning predictions when we're solving problems. And this is something that we did in a follow-up work there where we're saying, okay, let's look at benchmark instances first. My name of the game is to solve the network planning problem. So now you already know what I'm working on right now, but I wanna solve these messy network planning problems where I would have like a sub problem, all of these low planning uh, uh, problems, if you wish. But here we just said, let's do a proof of concept. We know that sometimes we have two st stage stochastic problems with super hard second stage problems. But now on the previous slide, I say I can use machine learning to predict the value of those sub problems. Okay. And we know that solving those sub problems is usually the computational bottleneck when we're solving two stage stochastic programs. So here we're using really the structure of OR algorithms. So we're using variants of the L shaped method. And the only thing that we're doing is sort of uh, replacing costly computations of sub problems with machine learning predictions. So we're pushing computation offline to gain computational time online. And we get huge speed ups actually. So when we are in our night setting that we designed it for with very costly second stage problems, we get speed ups between 11 to 167 times compared to an exact state of the art method. And we are as fast for the progressive compared to a progressive hedging baseline, which is an heuristic. So, and we are very, very close to optimal solution. The median gap is below, uh, is zero essentially uh, with a, quite a high precision. Uh, another benchmark is the stochastic multiple binary knapsack problem where we don't get as good speed ups and actually we get uh, beat by, the progressive, by a progressive hedging baseline. But here we have in the benchmark instances, there are only 20 scenarios. And our model is actually invariant. The predictions are invariant with respect to the number of scenarios. So uh, we get, gain edge of our method when the second stage problems are harder, essentially. So this is sort of what is going on right now is to look at the railroad applications again, which I find fascinating and see whether we can use these tricks to solve now the network planning problems under uncertainty. And that's all, I took too much time. I'm happy to take questions and I just wanna acknowledge the research funding that came from the Canadian National and and uh, the, the Natural Science uh, uh, Council here in Canada. Thank you. Thanks a lot for an amazing uh, talk, Emma. It was uh, very insightful. The problems are very interesting. And of course, uh, it wasn't a surprise. You explained them with, uh, uh, in, in a very, very nice and interesting and an understandable way.
despite the technical complexities involved in uh, understanding and solving these problems. So there are a couple of more questions here. So maybe we'll uh, okay. go. So <clears throat> let me read it out loud. Uh, in container ships, the containers are assigned to ships long before the containers arrive at the terminals. Do you think this might be possible for double stack trains as well? Yeah, so I think, um, so this is sort of the reservation uh, problems that I was referring to. So I think ideally for the operations, the containers uh, should be assigned to trains, right? Or like which, which train service the rail cars should be hooked onto essentially, right? Um, and so this is the case, at least uh, of the Canadian national uh, operations, they are sort of, they have a train service booking, typically. Um, now, the question is how you deal with those. So this was a bit like how you deal with those bookings was one of the aspects that I was discussing at the end. But nevertheless, they usually don't have, uh, you know, the, um, the reservation on the slot, right? So this is not possible to do before you know the characteristics of the container. So even if you have the train booking or the ship booking, you still need to solve sort of an equivalent of the LPSB, say exactly where it's going to be. So I think that's the storage plan for the, for the ships, right? So the storage plan is not necessarily done uh, when they are assigned to the ships. I'm not sure I answered the questions, but uh, yes, I think that it should. And in some cases, it, it's already that you have a train booking. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions myself. So uh, when you solve the uh, LPSP, uh, instead of you know solving it sequentially one after the other, do you always get the optimal solution for the LPP or sometimes you know the sequencing becomes so much harder if you actually get the optimal solution for LPP? Do you see something like that happening? So actually we have like a lexicographic ordering of the objective function. So we're making sure ah. that uh, we, the LPP part of the objective function is always dominating the sequencing part, but this is a good question because we, the, the most costly is sort of the train capacity, right? So if you can avoid having an empty slot in the train, uh, that's the largest costs for railroads typically. And also there is some, you know, aerodynamics into having like empty slots. It's not good for aerodynamics. So there are multiple reasons for why you definitely don't want to leave empty slots if you can. So we're sort of making sure that that cannot happen. Okay, okay. Uh, and also regarding your computational tests, uh, one thought I had was, instead of warm starting by solving the uh, load planning and sequencing, uh, load sequencing problem one after the other and use that as the warm start solution, uh, does it work better if you solve the LPFP without any distance metric and use that solution as a warm start for one-way distance? And you know, some smartly chosen one-way distance, that solution of LPSP as a warm starting point for two-way distance. Uh, version does that help? So, if I recall correctly, even the zero distance we can't solve for just giving the LPSP. Was that your suggestion that consider the zero distance LPSP yes. and then use that as a warm start for the two way? Yeah, the thing is that the, 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 the general purpose of, or, or at least CPLEX in our case, was not even able to solve the zero distance one for the LPSP. No, but no. maybe I, I got your point wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me rephrase my question. So you, your algorithm, as you explained here, which is you know, using this individual solution, that solves the zero distance problem, right? Uh, for, yeah, then... Let me pull that. Uh, here. So yeah. we saw the LPP. Yeah. Yes. yes. So uh, it, so, so, just, so so do all these things with zero distances and you have a solution. Right? Yes. And use this solution as one start for the two-way distance problem or one-way distance problem. Hmm. Does that make sense? 
Yes, uh, that makes sense. Uh, we still need to. So the reason why we're doing, we're not actually solving here the one way or the two way. The only thing we're doing is that we're adding, it, it becomes instantaneous to solve. We, we're just adding a cut to make sure that we account for the distance in the formulation correctly so that we get a good, a, a bound that is good. You see, because when we do the warm start, if I have the two way distance, I still need to account for it somehow uh, so that I get the correct bound when I'm warm starting. So all of these, we are not solving taking distance into account independently of which version of the objective we're using here. I see. Okay. okay. But I do think you're onto something. I do think one can do a lot better here mm -hmm. um, to, to improve even further on the, on the full solution. Yeah. Okay, okay. And uh, one more last question from myself. Uh, so when you look at uh, some of the solution processes, uh, are you, uh, is the difficulty on the primal part of the algorithm or in the dual part of the algorithm? Uh, which means, are you getting good solutions and is it just proving optimality that's taking time or you actually... Yes. Sorry, go. No, no, no. Or, or do you actually have to wait to even get good primal solutions? So and now it was a while ago because it took some time to get the paper published. It was a while ago I was looking at this, but uh, according to what I recall, but I would need to confirm, it's really quite easy to find a feasible solution. And this is why we're doing the warm start, right? It's really to prove optimality that is, uh, it's hard because you have a huge amount of symmetry in this problem. So it's really, most of the time when we have the big gap, it's really because a bound is not moving that these bound that these gaps are so large. Typically, we have already good solution, and I think this is sort of confirmed. Also, when we're doing the heuristics, they get to very good solutions um, uh, quite fast. So it's really proving optimality that is the the yeah, tough but, part. So, so, so if the, if that is the case, then the forty percent gap, forty five percent gap that we were looking at the result, that's not that big of a bad news, right, in some sense? Sorry, it's not... It's, it's not that hugely bad news, I'm, I was suggesting, right? It's No, 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 it's... No, exactly, but never... I mean, you see this also in network design problems, right? It's just that it's not easy to solve this problem exactly and, 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 and proving optimality. This is... But it's not super bad news, I agree. Uh, but the question is that we would like to be able to guarantee the optimality, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. yes, yes. But uh, I agree. I think there are uh, several sort of interesting avenues for future research on this problem, even on the exact approaches uh, for the reasons. I think it's uh, the results are super promising and one needs to sort of drill down on the solution method to, to speed up these things. Yeah. Uh, Let's wait a minute, maybe for any more questions. If not, uh, uh, we'll wrap up. Right. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Professor Emma Frejinger. That was an amazing talk. Uh, and I'm sure we all enjoyed it. And uh, it was uh, a special thanks for making it really lucid and understandable. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was an amazing uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs>